Okay, Jesse, last week was full of some really, really shitty dads. What do you got for me this time around? When a lonely divorcee meets a married 28-year-old mother on the internet, the connection is immediate. After their first in-person meeting, a torrid affair begins, and the roller coaster doesn't stop until two people are dead, and the contents of a mysterious briefcase brings a third to justice. I'm Andy Cassette. And I'm Jesse Prey, and this is Love Murder. Hi, Jesse. Welcome back, everyone, to Love Murder, a podcast about zigzags, dirt bags, and love gone fatally wrong. You can find Love Murder on TikTok and Instagram at Love Murder Pod and on Facebook by searching Love Murder Podcast. If you enjoy this show, please love slash murder a five star rating on your podcast app, subscribe, and review to help new people discover the show. Also, if you're interested in supporting the show more directly, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash lovemurderpod, where you can learn all about the different tiers of support. Speaking of Patreon, we are so excited, as always this week, to welcome and shout out a new set of absolutely wonderful patrons. Welcome to Pamela H., Christina B., and Melissa A. Also, side note, guys, we are recording these a couple weeks ahead so that we can be off for a couple weeks when we're traveling. So if you recently joined and you're wondering where is my shout out? You will get one. We are coming to you from the past right now. It's kind of like our maternity Exactly. Episodes. Exactly. Jesse's busting ass right now. I am busting ass because I don't think that just because we want to take a little vacay that you need to go a week without love murder. You're very committed. I'm very committed to be my listeners. I'm, I know how much you need us. Okay, maybe I need you more. But Andy is here with me in our studio today. I am. I'm sitting on Nick Cage's face. Wow. Not literally like the Nick Cage's face. <laughs> that would be a whole different type of episode. But a pillow that Amanda K sent you. Exactly. <laughs> we keep him in the studio. <laughs> this is a very interesting and complicated case that we are talking about today. There's a lot of moving parts. And I feel like also, Andy, you are going to have a lot to say about the subject of today's episode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not in a nice way. So I want to trigger warn you guys right up front because we're jumping right into this one that we will be talking about suicide today. And then later on in the story, there will be brief mentions of child abuse, both physical and sexual, but we will not be lingering on those areas. I will give you a little heads up when we're getting to one of those areas. So let's get into it. On a bright, cold morning in February of 2000, a woman was investigating a bad smell that permeated her home. The large house sat overlooking a lake near Odessa, Missouri, a sparkling gem in the summer. Now the landscape was just shades of gray and pale brown. Everything was cold and washed out. Washed out could be another term for the tenant staying in the woman's home, her husband's cousin, he had come home to Missouri after some troubles out west. A good guy, but he had definitely fallen on hard times. They had initially been very happy to welcome him to their downstairs apartment while he got back on his feet. But he had got behind in paying the rent, and now there seemed to be an odd smell mm. drifting up from the lower floor. Never good. The smell of rotten food, or she thought maybe even a sewer backup? The sound of the country music radio station met her ears as she knocked on the door, calling out, and then when she didn't hear, letting herself in. The twangy sound of the country music had been flowing up into the house softly all night. Well, there he was, sitting in a rust-colored recliner, his head tilted at an odd angle. She could see him from behind. Ah, <sighs> She thought, oh gosh, I hope he's not drinking again, and went to shake him awake when she realized that the smell was coming from the man. In horror, she rounded to face the recliner and found her husband's cousin dead. 
unmistakably so. His once good-looking features now marred by death and gore. As she backed out of the room in shock to call 911, the woman saw the very last things the man had before his life was ended. A view of the frozen lake and three framed photos. One depicted his ex-wife, another his children, and the third displayed a blonde woman in a white dress, clutching a rose. Later on, after the police had processed the scene, after the coroner had taken the poor soul's body away, a brother would be tasked with clearing out the man's belongings. Underneath the bed, he would find a briefcase. A briefcase with a warning. The instructions would say to open in case of trouble or death and to not open alone. The note proceeded with very specific instructions about how to open the briefcase and in front of whom. Opening the briefcase would become its own trial, an affair involving a bomb squad and a criminal defense attorney from Kansas City. But when the Pandora's briefcase was cracked, the secrets within would unlock the mysteries between two men's seemingly unconnected deaths. It would also remove the metaphorical mask of a true monster, revealing diabolical manipulations and truly heinous lies. And if that's not quite enough to boggle your minds, there is also a good old VHS turn of the millennia sex tape in this story. Oh, in the briefcase? It was near the briefcase. And it helped solve the case. Wow. It's entered into evidence, the sex tape. Wow. (laughs) So yeah, this episode is a roller coaster ride, y'all. Big thank you to Stacy for her recommendation and for sharing the book that I did use as my primary source as well. The book is called Fatal Error by Mark Morris and Paul Janchuski. They opened the book with a quote that I've never heard before, Andy, but it fits love murder so perfectly that I cannot believe I've never heard it before. So this is the quote. It's from a French journalist who died in 1917 named Octave Merbeau. And he wrote, murder is born of love and love attains its greatest intensity in murder. Whoa. (laughs) Which also, you guys, if that's the quote opening this book, you know that this is going to be a pretty crazy story. (laughs) Yeah. Totally apropos for love murder and certainly apropos for the case we are discussing today. This case was motivated by the most human of desires, lust, greed, a need for attention, a need for affection, a need for control. And then finally, in two very different ways, a desire to do the right thing. So let's start by talking about the blonde woman depicted in that last framed photo, a woman known as Cherie Miller. Cherie or Sherry, I'm not quite sure. We're going to go with Cherie because it's S-H-A-R-E-E, and I actually heard it pronounced two different ways in various things that I watched, was born on October 13th, 1971, and she did not have an easy go at life. She was born in Flint, Michigan, into a lower middle class family. Her biological dad split pretty shortly after her birth, and her mother went on to marry and divorce a few more times. The constant stream of men coming and going through Cherie's childhood would have probably been emotionally hard and destabilizing no matter what, but in Cherie's case, it was far, far worse. This is where the trigger warning comes in. Cherie was sexually abused starting at an early age. She would later say that she believed the abuse started as early as when she was three or four years old. Oh, my God. She dealt with the trauma by escaping into a world of fantasy, often writing stories about alternate versions of herself, living different lives. She also enjoyed a modeling school that her mother had put her in. And to her mother's credit, it sounds like when she did reveal the abuse. Her mother immediately divorced that stepfather and put Sheree into counseling. Okay. So I do think it sounds like the mother was doing her best. Yeah. So she got her into modeling school and Sheree really liked this as well. She said she, quote, could be someone else. I always wanted to be someone else. I always wanted to look like someone else. She said that she had also learned from her childhood that men were never to be trusted 
and she intended to use men and take what she wanted. She kind of felt like they'd always done that to her, so why not? Yeah. Cherie dropped out of school to get married at 17 years old. She had her first baby boy shortly after that. And then almost as quickly as they had been married, they were divorced. But it did sound like despite the divorce, this father was at least a little bit involved with the first child's life. Great. So Cherie got her GED. She got a job in a nursing home. And she began working towards getting like a nurse's assistant certificate, I believe, at this time. She was going to a community college. And she was really trying to turn her life around and provide for her kids. And it was around this time that she had a second baby, a little girl in May of 1993. But this time it sounded like the dad did not stick around at all. So this was somebody she was dating, never turned into marriage. And from what I understood, he seemed to be completely out of the picture. But Shree did end up meeting a man pretty quickly after this because she got married for the second time in 1994 and her daughter was born in May of 93. So she must have met this guy pretty soon after. Then the couple welcomed a baby boy named Buddy in 1995. She's got three kids now. She's got three kids. They're all from different dads. Uh And I do believe she wanted this last father and her second husband to be her happy ending. But it was far from that. Again, trigger warning now for physical abuse of an infant. Oh, my God. (sighs) So Cherie would later go on the Montel Williams show to talk about what happened to her third baby, Buddy. He was only six months old, Cherie said, when her husband had thrown the baby against a wall. Now, she hadn't been home at the time. She had been working and her ex-husband, now ex-husband, had called her to say that Buddy had fallen and he had bumped his head. She would say that she rushed home and found that Buddy's head was swollen to the size of a basketball. Oh, my God. And when she took the child to the hospital, they, of course, did x-rays and MRIs and found out that there were other signs of child abuse, physical abuse on his body. So Buddy did survive, but he suffered brain damage. Oh, my God. That's horrifying. So Cherie immediately filed for divorce, but she also accused husband number two of stalking her. She was rightfully incensed that the husband, after only serving four and a half months in prison, was granted visitation of the child. What? That's why she was going on the Montel Williams show to talk about how unfair the justice system was and how it's not protecting children. During this custody dispute and child abuse investigation, Cherie had to undergo a psychological evaluation, and the psychologist determined that Cherie was within the low average range of intellectual ability. And that might have had something to do with the fact that at 24 years old with three kids, she had an eighth grade reading level. Okay. But the psychologist felt that, quote, the tests understated her true intellectual powers, which we will absolutely see throughout the course of this episode. What Cherie's gifts were, were not things that were going to be quantifiable on some basic exam. In 1997, Cherie was 25, turning 26, again with three kids. Now she's gone through enough trauma to fill 20 lives. So she had been working at the nursing home when that happened to Buddy, and she decided she wanted a completely fresh start. So she already had a side hustle of selling Mary Kay cosmetics as a consultant. So she was doing that on the side, and then she also got hired as a bookkeeper at a salvage yard. Now, she's in Flint, which is outside of Detroit. It's near where the GM factory used to be. I don't know if it's still there. I'm sure there's some semblance, but they I know they laid off a ton of people during this era. Yeah. So there's obviously cars everywhere. So a salvage yard, which in case you don't know, is just like a yard full of like cars and they take the car parts out and sell them to people. So Cherie really liked this work. She also like set up at the desk, like her own little Mary Kay like situation on the desk. Oh my gosh, so funny. Yeah, and would give out free samples of like men's cologne. I guess Mary Kay made that too to sell it to the guys coming into the salvage yard. 
And everyone liked that she brought a woman's touch to what is such a usually masculine space. And she especially liked her boss, Bruce Miller. For the first year or so of Cherie's employment, they both had other outside romantic interests. But when they happened to become single around the same time, Cherie pounced. She wholeheartedly admitted that she was the one who pursued Bruce, even though he was 20 years older and had been married quite a bit before. Bruce was a loyal, hardworking guy who had a laid-back energy. His absolute passion in life was cars. There was no doubt about it. He was nearing retirement after working the General Motors' third shift pretty much his entire life. Wow. They said when he was 46, when he met Cherie, he had already been there for almost 30 years. He went right there after high yeah. school, which is also a hard shift to stay on for decades. Yeah. In his spare time, he had built his salvage business, which was born less out of money and more out of his love of cars and tinkering. It was like his dream. He also was a huge NASCAR fan, with Dale Earnhardt being his number one guy. Numero uno. Yes, I think so. Guys, I also, just so you know, I watched a pretty recent 2020, which is really excellent. I very much recommend it. I will refer to it a couple times throughout this episode. It is season 44, episode 15. And you'll begin to realize when we get deeper into the story why it's called You've Got Jail. Oh, my God. <laughs> Such a great title. There's a Forensic Files about this, season eight, episode 34, Web of Seduction. And there's a little Lifetime movie we'll talk about later. You really got to watch them all, huh? Oh, I watched it all. I watched it all. And I think the 2020, they were talking about how he liked Dale Earnhardt because he was just a, like a good old-fashioned, straightforward driver, not like flashy Jeff Gordon. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, Bruce's other passion was matrimony. That man just loved to be married. By the time Bruce connected with Cherie, he was 46 years old and coming off of his third divorce. His brother is on the 2020, and he said that the guy just liked having a wife. Bruce also had two grown children from his first marriage to his high school sweetheart. Bruce and Cherie had had a pretty friendly, warm Boston employee relationship. Okay. But that all changed when Cherie was there to comfort Bruce on the anniversary of his father's death. It was the first anniversary. He was taking it hard. Okay. One thing led to another, and the two quickly moved out of the friend zone and into the bedroom. Into the bed zone. Into the bed zone. It was a relationship that drew quite a bit of attention, not only because, obviously, Bruce was Cherie's boss— but Bruce was 20 years older and a foot taller than Cherie as well. Wow. He was 6'2 and she was 5'2. And even more than that, everyone thought that Bruce, with his grown children and now potentially going on his fourth marriage, was in a place to slow down with his life. He was coming up on retirement and he planned to just tinker and run his salvage business. Whereas Cherie was only, you know, I think by the time they hooked up, 27 or so. Yep. And she had three young children. Yep. So that's putting him like right back where he had been 20 years before raising his own young children. Yeah. So people were surprised that he was willing to do this and had the energy to go for a younger woman and take on her younger children as well. The bed zone must have been strong. The bed zone, I think, is maybe Cherie's strongest point. That's something they couldn't test on for the psychological test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that her bed zone had been fairly full because there was quite a few comments about how Cherie had already dated half the town at this point including a good friend of Bruce's who even tried to warn him off of dating Cherie. So this guy, John Hutchinson, told Bruce that Cherie was too sly by half, that's a quote, and that she'd cause him a boatload of trouble, which Cherie kind of admitted to. She told Bruce's family that she was a, quote, wild child, and Bruce was settling her down. <laughs> Every family loves to hear that. <laughs> But Bruce did not care a lick about any warnings or naysayers. He was a grown-ass man, and he loved Cherie. She was a handful, but she was young and beautiful and vibrant. And he did really care about her and her kids. Bruce's brother Chuck and sister-in-law Judy uh, were like, okay, uh-oh, here we go again. 
Cherie is going to be wife number four because he just got to get married, Bruce. And they were right. Bruce proposed in early 1999, and the couple eloped in Las Vegas on April 23rd that same year. The Miller family celebrated the news when the newlyweds came back to Flint with a party at a karaoke bar. Fun. Yeah, so Cherie loves karaoke. It's always country western songs, of course. Okay. That's her specialty. And the Lifetime movie, which we will discuss later, really focused on her love of karaoke. It was a big part of the the movie. But this fun night was disrupted for Chuck and Judy when an acquaintance told them, like, straight up, this is their marriage ceremony at home. And this friend of Chuck and Judy's came over to them and they were like, oh, she married your brother? And they were like, yeah. And guys, I hate this word. So this is a quote. It is not from me. This woman said, well, she's nothing but a slut and a liar, so good luck. (laughs) It's the combo for me, though. It's the combo. Yeah. So that's, they were kind of already on edge about this, not knowing if number four was going to be the charm for lucky number four. Yeah. And then literally as they're celebrating their elopement, one of their friends says this to them. So they're like, oh, oh, no, where is this going? Not an auspicious beginning to the family and the marriage. Well, Cherie had pursued Bruce and she had hooked him. She would later say that, quote, someone was finally taking care of us instead of hurting us. Someone was actually in my children's life to do them right. It's sweet, though. It is. And there's nothing wrong with finding a partner that truly loves you and wants to support you and your children and help you and your family grow. Of course not. But sadly, Cherie was not doing right by her husband. Mm. (sighs) Even when Bruce began the process to adopt her children. So he really was trying to do right by them. While she should have been on top of the world, there was just this gaping hole inside of Cherie that could never be filled. It was never enough. She began to try to fill it with shopping sprees. I think in some part she was making up for the years that she could not give her children everything that they wanted okay. by buying them loads of clothes and toys, anything that they could possibly want. I guess that they got an above ground pool and Bruce paid his brother $1,000 to build a deck around it, all for the kids to go swimming in. And somebody also said that It was very wasteful how Cherie spent money. Like if her her kids were sick of their toys, she would gather them all up, throw them away, and just go buy new toys. Yeah, that seems extreme. Yeah. And wasteful. Very wasteful. Only within a few months of her wedding, Cherie had run up $46,000 in credit card bills in Bruce's name. Adjusted for inflation, that's more like 84 grand. Oh my God, that makes me sick. She was also his bookkeeper. So she was opening credit cards under his name and she was moving things around so he wouldn't find out. Oh my God. And that's not all she was up to. While Bruce was hard at work doing nights at GM and days at the salvage yard, Cherie was glued to the computer, logging hours and hours on chat rooms and AOL instant messenger. This is the uh, late 90s. ASL. <laughs> She was ASLing all over the place because she was especially a fan of online porn and sexually themed chat rooms. Did you have to pay for it back then? She says, I think it was either in the book or on the 2020, on one of these, she readily admits that she would get all of the free porn she could. They used to like give you a preview and then you'd have to pay or something. Okay. She's like, oh, I got really good about like finding all the ways I didn't have to pay for online porn. Oh, the things that you brag about. <laughs> On the 2020, she said she might have had an online sex addiction. You think? hmm Yeah, so this was the ultimate, I guess, medium for somebody like Cherie. Because if you think about it, in her childhood, she wanted to pretend to be somebody else. She liked modeling schools to change her look. She liked writing stories where she was somebody else. And now she could be online being whoever she wanted to be, whoever they wanted her to be. And she was talking to real people, but she could lie her face off and there was no consequences. Yeah. She, across, I don't know, a few years, developed 30 different screen names. Whoa. Yeah. Some of them were, you know, the obvious. Cherie 1013. That's her birthday. To the more 
cutesy, I guess. Sexy kitten only for you. With a four and a U or of what? Of course, a four and a U. Called it. To the downright blatant, I want to be laid. Just I want to be laid. Yep, I want to be laid. That's the screen name. To be? No, it was actually she wrote to be like T-O-B-E. Wow. Missed opportunity there. I know. It should have been the letter two. Two and then one B. Yeah. Yeah. In May of 1999, Bruce began planning a big NASCAR race trip that he was excited about. So they are very newly married. They got married on April 23rd. So the very next month, he's like, look, in July, I'm going on this big trip with my racing buddies. It's just dudes only. So you should at the same time, my sister-in-law will babysit. You should go on a girl's trip with your friend. Uh, okay. So she was deciding between a couple of places. And one of the places she was interested in going was Reno, Nevada. So she got on the old trusty internet and she began going into chat rooms about Reno to try to figure out what she would do if she went there, if they selected that as their girl's trip place. So who's she going with, though? It's a friend of hers named Jennifer. Now, we'll get into this trip to Reno that she does eventually take, but Jennifer says that she was pretty sneaky. She didn't know what was going on. Okay. She began chatting with this guy who was at the time going by the screen name Reno Dudes who was happy to offer advice. The man she was speaking to was an ex-cop turned pit boss named Jerry Cassidy, who worked at Harrah's Casino in Reno. To say that the two hit it off would be quite an understatement. Within a couple days, the conversation went from travel advice to full-on cyber sex. Oh, wow. You remember cyber sex? I don't think I ever did it because I was too young. Yeah, no, but it was there. It was there for the taking. Yeah. I just don't think I availed myself of it. No. We were also <laughs> like 12. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like happening all over. Yeah. I think by the time we went to college, that was kind of like the swan song of AOL Instant Messenger. No one was doing chat rooms anymore. Yeah. But I still remember my freshman year, I put up like my AOL like out of office basically, like with the song lyrics and the stuff. Like, I'm not here right now, but leave me a message. Did you not use it at all in college because you're younger than me? Yeah, no, we didn't. I didn't use it at all in college. I think it was just my, yeah, it was just my freshman year that I still used it. So who is Cherie's new internet lover? Jerry was from Kansas City, Missouri, the youngest of four brothers who grew up as a good Midwestern boy. He loved to hunt and fish. He had good manners. He loved God. I mean, it was just a very typical upbringing. He was born on October 6, 1960, which made him almost exactly 11 years older than Cherie. From a very early age, Jerry knew he wanted to be a police officer. He went to school for criminal justice, and he was in two fraternities that were involved in criminal justice, like the main criminal justice fraternity and then their version of like a Phi Beta Kappa, like one for scholastic achievement within criminal justice. Wow. So he was dedicated. And all of his hard work did pay off because he earned a spot with the Marshall, Missouri PD and was quickly considered a rising star within the department. In less than six months, he was promoted to detective lieutenant overseeing the criminal investigation division. Oh, my God. He was so passionate about law enforcement. Jerry soon struck up a romance with a dispatcher who also worked for the department, a single mother named Barbara. Jerry loved Barbara and her two sons. The couple married, he adopted Barbara's sons, and then they added another little baby boy to their brood. Whoa. Lots of boys. He's one of four. Yeah. And now he has three boys himself. But unfortunately for the growing family, Jerry's dream job became a nightmare due to a corrupt police chief. Stop. Yeah, and he's, like, so passionate about law enforcement, and then he would have to deal with someone who's, like, completely undercutting the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the first indication to him that something was not quite right was because this guy fired his wife while she was pregnant and was very open about the fact that it was just because she was pregnant. And it's illegal. Yeah. So they started legal proceedings against the department, but Barb ended up dropping them because she did not want anyone to retaliate with Jerry's job. And she never went back to the department even after having their last son because it was just a bad environment by yeah, that point. Yeah, could you point. imagine going back there? Yep. So already there's a bad taste in their mouth. But then Jerry began to notice that the chief was falsifying and tampering with evidence, even in murder cases. What? He was just making things work to whatever his theory was or whatever he wanted it to be. 
there was also some other, it, like a lot of shady shit was going on. And he was between a rock and a hard place because he really wanted to do the right thing. And he eventually did. He did eventually become a whistleblower, but it was at the cost of his career. Really? Oh, Andy, you know there is about nothing I love more, you know, other than you and love murder and my family, than trying out new beauty products. Oh, I know. It is definitely your thing. And I love when we find new products that we both are absolutely over the moon for. Yes, and today's sponsor has a product that really turns something that I used to find to be a total pain into something that I'm quite genuinely looking forward to now. Yep, of course, we're talking about the Athena Club razor. It is such an improvement over my old razor. The blade on my old razor used to get all goopy after just a few uses. And with Athena, the water-activated serum means there's enough of it to soothe while shaving. But it never gets skunky on the blade. Yeah, and unlike my old razor that left my legs dry and got really dull quickly, the sharp blades on Athena Club's razors are really gentle on my skin. It's a very close shave, but yet I don't get any of the nicks that I used to get. Yep. And my legs are feeling moisturized and super smooth, which is great going into summer. Seriously, since switching, I've gotten zero razor bumps with Athena Club's razor. That's because the Athena Club razor is designed with built-in skin guards to help prevent razor burn while being gentle on curves. Plus, the razor blade is surrounded by a water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid which is a holy grail for skincare. Yeah, also their amazing shaving cream does not hurt too. And it smells good. It does. It's got lychee. The best part is the razor kit is only $10 and comes with two blade heads, a magnetic hook for your shower storage, which I am obsessed with, and your choice of a handle color. The handle color options are very cute, but they even have a black and white razor for all of you minimalists out there. I got the cute blush color. I got the blue. (laughs) Jessica, you will be shocked to know that I got the baby blue and I'm actually digging it. I am because you're usually one of those minimalist folks I was talking about. The blue is a really nice baby blue. It matches a lot of our bathroom essentials. And with Athena Club, You never have to think about blade refills because you choose how often you want your replacement blades shipped to you for free and you'll never be stuck with an overused blade longer than it should be used for, which I've pretty much been guilty of in the past my entire shaving career. Ditto. Athena Club also has the most amazing shave foam that will leave your skin soft, hydrated, and smooth. The shaving cream truly smells like a super bloom cloud. You know, I'm a sucker for lychee, and it's no wonder Athena's razor has thousands of five-star reviews from customers online. Switch to the better razor and show your skin you care with Athena Club. Get started today by shopping in-store at Target stores nationwide. Just head to the shaving aisle to find the razor kit, cloud shave foam, wax strips, and razor refills. So while this investigation was going on, This chief was still in control, and he had a lot of people on the force who were very loyal to him. So Jerry and Barbara were both harassed for months. They got threatening phone calls, threatening their children. They had shit happen to their cars, to their house. So even after the chief was removed and prosecuted, I think that there was just so much... PTSD involved in going through this situation. And the corruption runs deep. It like runs, you're training a lot all of, of your staff members to be corrupt too. Exactly. So there's a lot of people loyal, a lot of people caught out in this. And I think still there was a feeling of you don't go back on your brothers in the police force, even if they're doing something wrong. Yep. So he was doing the right thing. He had also injured his leg while he was working on the force and he had gone on disability. He okay. needed to have this surgery. So when he was out on disability, he realized that he could never go back. It just wasn't the same for him. His dreams were smashed. He also had started taking, like we've talked about in so many cases, pain medication yep. that he grew an addiction to. Yep. So even though the case eventually was resolved, Jerry just couldn't do it. He yeah. lost his will. He lost the heart to be a cop. And his mother and his wife, Barbara, said that that was the moment that changed Jerry forever. Okay. That he was never the same after losing what had been his dream. 
Instead, he got a job working security on a Missouri River gambling boat, and he eventually then turned that into a job as a security supervisor for Harrah's North Kansas City Hotel and Casino. In 1996, he was trained to become a dual-rate table game supervisor on the floor, which is also known as a pit boss okay. in a casino. So it's like the guy who's like on the floor making sure that everything's going smoothly, no one's doing anything shady. Which also meant, though, that he could run any of the tables. Like, he could run a roulette wheel. He could run a blackjack table. He knew everything at that point. So cool. Yeah, and he really liked this work, but he got a little too into it. Too into the nightlife. Got it. So he is now working nights. Barb is working days. He also starts drinking a lot at this point, which everyone said was very typical of people who worked in the casino. Okay. It wasn't uncommon for them to get off their shift no matter what time of the day it was and just start drinking. Crazy. And they'd be like drinking at the casino, it sounds like, too, or doing it while they were working. It just was kind of a free for all, it sounded like. Okay. How are you supposed to like keep track of people playing cards and doing things? That's what I don't know. But they said it was very uh, typical of this industry in this time period. Okay. So nobody really thought that much about his drinking, like professionally. But obviously it was affecting his home life. And even if he hadn't been indulging in alcohol and prescription medication, it still would have been hard on the marriage just having opposite schedules and never seeing each other. Exactly. So in 1998, Jerry was offered an opportunity to transfer to Reno, Nevada, which is obviously a much bigger casino than the one in Kansas City. And he jumped at the chance. Now, Barb had just gotten a really well-paying, good job, and she definitely wasn't keen on giving that job up and disrupting the three boys who were all in school. Yeah. But she was willing to give it a shot because she was hoping that the change of scenery would invigorate Jerry. Maybe it would give him a different sense of peace. Maybe he could get over what had happened if he was in a new place completely. Yeah. But it didn't work. After only a month of living in Reno, Jerry basically told Barb to go back to Missouri. And I think at that time he said something like, I want a separation, but I don't necessarily want a divorce. And Barb was like, yeah, if I go back, we're going to get a divorce. Yeah. So her eldest two sons wanted to return as well. They were older. They had more roots in Missouri. So she made plans to move back with them. And Kenny is a pseudonym of their son. It was used in the book and it's used in various other places. I'm going to stay with it, even though I think that the son, Jerry's son, is actually on 2020 under his real name. But I'm going to stick with Kenny for now. The couple's youngest child had already started school, so he decided to stay with his dad. Okay. So the two oldest sons are moving back with Barbara. He still has Kenny. And then the deal was basically that Kenny would stay with Jerry during school because I guess at this time they had like a two or three months on and then one month off rather than a typical summer vacation. Okay. So it was a different type of schedule. And then Kenny would go to be with his mother during every school break. So that was how they were intending on doing it as long as Jerry was being a good dad to Kenny. Yeah. That's all that mattered. So at this point, he still did have at least his youngest son. He had also met two pretty good friends named Carol and Gloria who spoke extensively to the authors of the book I used and are on the 2020 And they liked Jerry a lot. They did blackjack and roulette, respectively, these two women. So they worked on the floor with Jerry. They thought he was so much fun. And they would later say that he just struck them as a guy going through a midlife crisis. I mean, moving to Reno and leaving your family, that kind of sounds like it. It really was. I think that he was adrift. Yeah. Because he was looking at his life without law enforcement. And I feel like he was trying to shed himself of, almost everything that was part of his old life, including, sadly, his wife. Yeah, and and child. I mean, two out of three, he adopted those boys. They were his boys. Jerry was introduced to computers and the internet through his work at the casino, and he fell headlong into a new addiction, the World Wide Web. Jerry was definitely unmoored at this time. He was battling alcoholism, prescription pill addiction, He was still grappling with trauma and now divorce. So by the time Cherie met him online, he was like this dry kindling. And she was the match that would light his whole world up and then burn it to the ground. (laughs) 
Within days of connecting with Cherie, Jerry was telling people that he was falling in love with a woman he had met online. And she's married right now. Oh, yeah. And also when she starts doing this research, it's in May. So she's been married for a month or maybe less. Yep. He said that Cherie was wild, sexy, funny. She made him feel understood, desired, and loved things that he said he hadn't felt in a long time. And they are just talking online at this time. Just yep. cyber sexing it up. Yep. They were soon messaging each other around the clock like lovesick teenagers. And who boy were these messages steamy. It was like penthouse letters for dummies. <laughs> That's the vibe. Okay. They began fantasizing about their first sexual encounter that they were going to have when Cherie went to Reno and got to meet Jerry in person. To whet his appetite, Sherry sent Jerry a now infamous VHS sex tape that was labeled for Jerry's eyes only. They've exchanged photos of each other then. Yes. Lots okay. of photos, lots of sexy talk. And now she actually recorded a VHS sex tape and then went to a post office and mailed it to him with snail mail. Okay. Sex tape with who? Oh, it's just her. It's just her. Okay. Yeah, it's just her. Oh, we're getting into this. So there is actually a clip of this tape on, I think, both the 2020 and the Forensic Files, definitely the Forensic Files, where you see some of the safer elements for work from this video. But I got to say, Messrs. Morris and Janchuski over here with the book, really went into detail. Oh. They wanted the readers to really know what was on this tape because it was reading like, I don't know, like the transcript of a Skinamax. It was really a lot. So I'm not going to read this softcore pornography. Jessica. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. But... I will read the first couple paragraphs that they used to set the scene, which was absolutely part of this bizarre sex tape. I saw the cover and I thought it said fatal erection. <laughs> so the book is called Fatal Error and he thought it was fatal erection. And the most hilarious thing about this book, guys, we will definitely include the cover of the book on the Instagram, is that they picked the most heinous picture of Cherie. She was an attractive lady and they picked like this still from an internet video that she looks like an actual demon. No, she does. Yeah. We digress. But Andy, here is how the authors, Mark Morris, Paul Janchowski wrote about this sex tape. The lights are low and the music, a country duet, is warm and romantic. A small VHS camera catches a digital clock in the lower left-hand corner. It's 11.55 p.m. Her kids are in bed, and her husband, at work. The stage is set for simple, sensual pleasures. I love that they're, like, transcribing. They're transcribing the sex tape, which means they had to watch it a lot to describe everything going on. Miller is wearing a beige knit slip, decorated with flowers. Her full blonde hair is pulled back from her face, and curls cascade down her back. Oh, my God. By the way, that was clip-on hair. She has short blonde hair, so that was clip-on extensions. As Miller begins to lip sync the song, her camera whirs away. What captured. song, though? They didn't say. It's a country music duet. That's all they gave us, Andy. Oh. <sighs> so she's singing both parts. Yes. Capturing her reflection in the mirrored headboard of her gently rolling waterbed. Oh, my God. We might have to find, like, just the beginning of this to put on the Instagram, too. Flickering candles bathe Miller in a soft glow, subtly darkening her hair and adding warmth to the room. Miller settles into the rolling waterbed and impishly pulls her night slip up and over her knees, exposing a blonde tuft of hair. From her vagina? I think so. A blonde tuft of hair? Slowly, Miller begins to knead her ample breasts. Okay, that's where I'm going to stop, guys. Oh my God, no, you have to keep going. <laughs> This is so detailed. It's very detailed. The next part, you'll just have to read on your own time. Go buy the book, guys. It's Fatal really- Fatal Erection. F by <laughs> Fatal Erection by Mark Morrison. Paul Chowski. Wowza. So I got to say, though, Jerry was here for it. 
He was loving this tape. Obviously. Yeah. He got it in the mail. Got it in the mail. It snailed its way over to him. And then the author said it was well used in his VHS player. You could tell, remember? Oh, yeah. This one was like worn out. It was practically melted by the time the authorities found it. (laughs) It's like warped. (laughs) So this is crazy. I mean, he has to be going out of his mind. He started talking to this woman online, and then he's getting homemade porn in the mail before he ever even meets her in real life. Yeah, I'd say there's not much more left to milk of the cow. (laughs) No, except for drinking the IRL milk, which is going to happen in July of 1999 when they finally met in person. Now, Cherie was going to Reno with her friend, but she was sneaking around with Jerry. So she was arranging it for them to meet when her friend had already gone to bed, basically. Yeah. Yeah, she said that the friend would later say that the only time she remembered seeing Jerry was when Cherie was saying, oh, this pit boss is totally hitting on me and he wants to have a drink. But I told him we couldn't have a drink until you could come with us because I don't want to be alone with him. So she was even trying to say, like, she was covering it up. Yeah. But they did get it on, like, Donkey Kong, that first Reno visit in mid-July. And this is not even three full months since she got married, folks. So what did Jerry know about his married lover's husband? Nothing that was true. Okay. Cherie said, she even says later, well, I told him a lot of stories that first time we met. She said that she was married to a man named Jeff who had been doing some sort of construction to their roof when he fell off and injured his head. So he was still alive, but he was brain dead and in a coma, lingering, but close to death. That's what she tells him. Wow. Okay. So she's like, yes, I'm going to be single soon, essentially, because I think he's going to die. And that's what I'm going through right now. It's very hard on me. And she did say that Jeff's brother, Bruce, the name of her real husband, had moved into her house to help care for her dying husband while she's working or away. So I guess if that means that if Jerry ever called and it was a Bruce, that would make sense of it. Very elaborate. Very elaborate. Cherie was honest about her kids. She said she had kids. She didn't try to hide that aspect of her life. But she also told Jerry that she was a wealthy woman. She said that she owned multiple nursing homes as well as a salvage yard. And that wasn't all. She also had pending lawsuit settlements that were going to pay her a pretty penny. So she is definitely acting like she's got a lot of money. She's she's pumping it up. Independently wealthy. Yep. So, of course, Jerry was completely blown away by Sherry. He thought she was perfect. I mean, she's up for sex. She's fun. She's funny. He thinks she's smart. She's soon to be single. And She's rich. He couldn't believe his luck. (laughs) Meeting in person had only heightened the couple's feelings for one another. So Cherie returned to Reno in August. So she goes back home after this. And then she tells Bruce that she had a client or there was some sort of Mary Kay convention or something. She had to go back in August one month later to sell her Mary Kay products. At that point, Jerry very much was telling everyone that they were together. This was his girlfriend. And he was introducing her to everyone. So he introduced her to Carol and Gloria, his friends. He introduced her to his son on this visit. And everyone was happy for Jerry. They said that they were very much like teenagers in love, like so much PDA, holding hands all the time. Just they were happy that there was some woman that was so crazy about him because they all had worried about him a little bit. On this visit, so the very second time that they're together, they start to map out what a life together would look like. Like, would Sheree and the kids move to Reno? Maybe she'd get a job at the casino as well. They'd get married. They would have a kid together. Why does she need a job if she's so rich? Well, that's what he thought. It was kind of weird, too, because at that visit, she started asking Carol and Gloria about, like, oh, do you think I could get a job here? And all three of them were like, why would she need a job if she has so much money? Mm Mm-hmm. So that was like a a little red flag. But Jerry just was not seeing any red flags at this point. They could have been right in front of his face. Yeah. And he was just thinking about that boom, boom. The sex tape. The sex tape. Yep. And that was another thing. It's like they had all these conversations, which we know because we can see all of their instant messages later. That she's like, yeah, we'd get to like wake up together and make love every day. So it's just like they're planning this life together. And then Sharif finagled yet another Reno trip in September. 
So she's going back every month. This is the third month in a row that she's going to Reno. She's telling poor Bruce that she has some sort of business going on there. Yep. And this time when she came back, she had some big news for Jerry. The future was coming faster than they had expected because Cherie was pregnant. What? Yes. And she said that it was Jerry's because she was not having sex with her husband because he was in a coma. Whoa. So Jerry was ecstatic. He really, really wanted a baby and he really wanted Cherie. He was like, I know this is fast, but sometimes when things are right, they move fast. When you know, you know. Now, of course, at this point, his friends and family had been, like, pretty excited for him that he was excited about dating this new woman. Now they're kind of like, what? First of all, his mother, Charlene, was like, this is moving way too fast. You're not even, his divorce wasn't finalized. Yeah. And so she was a little concerned about that. And his friends were like, how does she know so fast that she's pregnant? She was here, like, four weeks ago. So if it happened then, how, like, you usually don't even, like, know that fast. No, until, like... Six weeks. Yeah. So the women that he was friends with were kind of like, I don't know if she's being honest with him. So everyone's kind of taking a step back from this at this point. Except for Jerry, who's full speed ahead. Like I said, red flag, he's like the bull. He's like going for it. Yeah. So around the time of this trip and this announcement too, Cherie also told him that Jeff had died. So her husband, Jeff, had died in August. But... And this is a really big but because I'm not sure how she worked around this one with Jerry. Cherie said that in the aftermath of Jeff's death, when she was suffering from terrible grief, she had married his brother Bruce out of obligation. She was like, he was there. He had always said he loved me so much and that apparently after Jeff died, he came clean with his feelings towards me and how Jeff would have wanted us to be together. And out of obligation, I agreed to marry him on the spot. So Jeff is out. Bruce Miller is her husband again. And she's carrying Jerry's baby. That's definitely Jerry's baby. This is just to keep you guys abreast of what's going on at this point, because it gets even crazier. Bruce, Cherie's new husband. New, new. New, new husband, whom she married out of obligation and grief, was involved in organized crime. Oh. Something that she did not know until she married him, even though he'd been living with her to take care of his brother in a coma. So now she was stuck in this loveless marriage to her dead husband's mobster brother because if she left... You'd obviously kill her. He'd track her down and kill her, yeah, obviously. obviously. Because he's a mobster. Absolutely. So Jerry was understandably very concerned with this situation. And he became even more so when Cherry tearfully admitted after much conversation, like she would like tease something like, oh, it's really bad. And then she'd like go away for a few hours and come back and be like, I just don't want to talk about it. So he had to like pull out of her that the situation was worse than he had thought. And that now there's a trigger warning for this, guys, but it is for sexual assault, but it's not real. So just keep that in mind. That Bruce had been raping and beating her. And she's pregnant with his child. Yes. Yeah. And she said that Bruce's violent behavior was escalating. And then the unthinkable happened. On September 23rd, 1999, Cherie told Jerry that Bruce had beaten her on their pool deck and raped her so badly that she had lost their baby. And this is when Cherie told Jerry that the only way that she would be free and that her kids would be safe and their future would be secure was if Bruce was... D-E-A-D. Yes, Bruce had to die. Life doesn't happen bi-weekly, so why should payday? The money you earn can be in your hands today with Earnin. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work, up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. Just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then access up to $100 a day as you work and leave an optional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. There have been so many times in my life where I feel like I would have loved to use something like Earnin. Oh, absolutely. Me too. And I love how consumer-centric Earnin is. There are no mandatory fees, just the option to leave a tip. 
Plus, there are no credit checks or dings to your credit. Make Earnin part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, "When I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability and security. It gives me a lot of peace of mind." Download Earnin today, spelled E A R N I N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in "Love Murder" under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help our show. Love Murder under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, daily max and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Now, Jerry was a former detective, so he knew that this was not a good plan. Cherie was definitely going to be the number one suspect as the spouse. Yep if they plotted any way to kill him. And he's a former cop who was basically left his job for doing the right thing. So he doesn't want to kill anyone. No. He suggested all sorts of nonviolent solutions to the situation involving getting law enforcement involved, having her leave while he was at work in the middle of the night with the kids and come to him. Yeah. All of the ways, even the ways that she could subtly get him to want to divorce her. Yep. He's like, I have a ton of tactics. Like, we're going to get you out of this marriage. But obviously, homicide is not one of those. Did she know that he was an ex-cop? Yeah, he talked about it. Yeah, so I feel like you would know. I mean, I guess you could think that they're a corrupt cop, but. Or she thinks he's going to know how to get away with it because he'll know what evidence the police are going to look for. Yeah. But Sharia always had a reason why none of these ideas would work. There was always, oh, because he'll find me. Oh, because of this. Oh, because I can't. Like, there's only one way. She kept saying it. And by now, Jerry was a mess. He was stressed out. He was frustrated. He was worried. She would stop talking to him out of the blue and then pop back on and be like, it was really bad. And so he's like losing his mind, of course, at this point. He couldn't concentrate at work. He was drinking more than ever. I think at some point he got a DUI. And then in the midst of all of this, Jerry went out one night to play blackjack at a different casino. And I guess he got up to go to the bathroom and he had left his like money and his chips on the table, assuming that the blackjack dealer was going to be watching them for him. Okay. But he didn't. And they were stolen. So Jerry got pissed. Now he's a pit boss and he's a former cop. So he's like, I know you have cameras in here. Run it back. I want to see who took my shit. And they refused to. They're like, You don't get up and walk away from your money and your chips. You just don't do it. Sorry, you lost. Them's the breaks. Get the fuck out of here. Okay. And he, like, lost his mind. He's, like, screaming at everybody to the point where a bouncer was called to remove him. And as he was getting thrown out of the casino, Jerry claims that in his anger he had slammed the door. It was a back door. And it accidentally closed on a bouncer's hand like his hand was in the door jam when he slammed it oh no now jerry was drunk and he said that was just an accident he was just like slamming the door as he left because he was pissed but the bouncer claimed that jerry did it on purpose knowing where his hand was and it was with malicious intent and then jerry was arrested for assault so he's got like a dui under his belt at this point and now an assault charge so He had no money. He had no money. He's so worried about Cherie. Also, his poor son. His poor son woke up and had no idea where his dad was. And he was online on the computer trying to talk to Carol and Gloria and be like, do you know where my dad is? And his friends had to call and find out he was in jail and bail him out for his poor young son. So obviously, this very much seemed like Jerry's rock bottom. His family ended up getting involved. Cherie was actually involved in this too. And Barbara clearly took custody back of their son. Yep. And the entire family agreed that it was time for Jerry to seek treatment. Okay. So he had basically an intervention and he should move back to Missouri because this was not a good environment for him. He's not going to like that. Well, Cherie did come out to help him move and box stuff up. And at that point, Carol and Gloria said that she seemed like she was kind of done with the relationship, that he was going through a lot and he he needed help and she had her own problems, basically. Yeah. So she helped him box his stuff up. And then Jerry moved into his cousin's house's lower unit. Mm. Yeah. And he began the hard work of recovery. So he really was working the steps. He was going to counseling sessions. 
Meanwhile, back in Flint, Bruce was getting very suspicious of Cherie's constant Mary Kay trips to Reno. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that Reno was such a hotspot destination for Mary Kay. He had to also know that she wasn't actually selling anything. Yeah. As well as her spotty bookkeeping of the family finances, he told his brother that he knew she was spending too much money. And there were a couple times that he had tried to surprise her by taking a night off of work. And then he would come home and she wouldn't be there. So I would not be surprised if Cherie was also sleeping with somebody else. Local. Yeah. Something was definitely fishy in their still young marriage. And Bruce was going to find out what it was. His brother Chuck said that he was definitely on to Cherie about something. Yeah. Well, if Bruce had been able to read Cherie's emails, he would have known that she had some big news that she was hiding from him. On October 20th, Cherie emailed a picture of a positive pregnancy test to Jerry. Cherie had been in Reno when she had helped him pack his shit up. And apparently they had conceived then. Real fertile myrtle over here. Jerry's joy, though, was dampened when Bruce Miller himself, under the screen name BD Junk, because the salvage yard was B&D, yep. which, of course, Sherry had set up for him, and his family said he never used the computer, instant messaged Jerry with a taunting and confrontational tone. This Bruce, a.k.a. BD Junk, said that he knew all about Sherry's pregnancy. And that if Jerry tried to call or contact Sheree again, he would take it out physically on Sherry. He was going to beat her if Jerry tried to contact her. Uh, He also told Jerry that Sheree had retaliated by attacking him, Bruce, with a knife. And if she did so again, he would file attempted murder charges against her. And also, if you contact her, I will beat her and then I'll say she attacked me. So if Jerry wanted Sheree alive and well, he'd leave her alone. When Cherie got back in touch with Jerry, he begged her again. He said, now this guy's really dangerous. You're in so much danger. Please just put the kids in the car and get out here. Yeah. Just get away. You don't have to stay there. He's like, we'll make it work. And there was like a little bit of time. I don't know if it was a day or so that she seemed to entertain plans of like, okay, this is what I would do. This is the route I would take. We're going to make this work. Because it's from Detroit to Missouri at this point, right? So it's like yeah. not even that it's bad. It's Flint to where he is in Missouri. Odessa. Yeah. Yeah. And so it seems like he's getting his hopes up because he's like, she's going to escape. Yeah. Then she came back and she was like, no, no, it's not going to work. I'm just going to stay with Bruce because I'm just stuck here. I don't want to put anyone else's lives at risk. And if I try to leave, he'll just kill me. So... I guess I'll never be safe until Bruce is dead. Hint, hint. Wow. Just think of also, I mean, guys, if you read this book, there's pages and pages and pages of these messages back and forth. And you can see how even a guy who was a homicide detective at one point is getting pulled into this web of lies because he's so emotional about her. Yeah. And she's bringing him high and then low and then high and then low. He is just so emotionally tuned to believe her manipulations at and this trying point. to help her and trying to help her. I mean, she's hitting all the triggers like this yeah. is he went into law enforcement to help people. He wants to save her. So this is all just completely affirming his life view and his version of who he is within it. Yep. Uh, but it wasn't all bad news. Nine days later, Sheree called To tell him to check his email because they have some crazy news. They were expecting not just one baby, but two. It's twins. (laughs) Twins. Oh, (sighs) my God. Is she taking, like, fertility drugs? We don't know. I don't think so. Jerry was overjoyed, and he begged Cherie to send him the ultrasound photos. Because he said, I wish I could be there with you. Please, I want to see my babies. Now, she begged off for a couple days. Then finally, three days later, she did end up scanning the ultrasound pictures and sending them to Jerry. So this was all the confirmation he needed. He's like, okay, I saw the pregnancy test. It was positive. Now I've seen the ultrasound pictures. Of my twins. Yep. And he was going to be a daddy again. He was psyched. But somehow, Jerry 
failed to notice the date stamps on the ultrasound pictures. Oh, no. That were actually two different ultrasound pictures from different times in the early 90s, not three days earlier in late 1999. So were there two babies in the fetus? In the pictures, it was just one. She said that they could only get a picture of one baby at a time. Mm. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, this Total. is not true. But Jerry fully believes it. If we are staying in Jerry's mindset, he is 100% sure that he is having twins at this point with this woman. So crazy. Because she also sent him a picture of her growing belly, which in hindsight, we're going to include the picture, but it just looks like a woman sticking out, like blowing out her stomach. Burrito belly? Yes. It looks like she had a big lunch. But Jerry really wanted to believe that she was carrying his children. So he was seeing what he wanted to see. She says it later. She says on the 2020 that even she recognized that the picture didn't really look like she was really pregnant with twins. But she could tell that he was going to see what he wanted to believe. Yeah. Wow. He didn't question it. His happiness was short-lived as Bruce or BD Junk began messaging him once more saying that he was going to force Cherie, whom he referred to in these messages as a, quote, herpes-infected bitch. What? With two bastards in her. This is the the messaging. This is the language that Jerry is hearing from Bruce, thinking it's really Bruce. And it's, oh my God, it's not Bruce? (gasps) Yeah. Wow. So she's playing both email Mm -hmm. or usernames? Yes. I mean, you said she had, like, a ton of them. Yep. So why wouldn't she make up a fake abusive husband one? I mean, it makes it they're never online at the same time. Yep. And so he was basically going to force her to have an abortion and then wrote all this terrible stuff like, oh, I've heard that some women lose their minds when they have to give up their babies. Like, what do you think two will do to her? And then, like, emailed him a bunch of resources for women who lose their children. Oh, my God. Whoa. So he thinks this is Bruce. And so he is panicking. A few days went by with him not hearing from Sheree, too. But instead, again, from this BD junk, who's Bruce, he thinks, taunting Jerry with descriptions of how Sheree had performed oral sex on him and that she had gone to get the abortion and saying that, thanks for everything because our marriage is better than ever and she's going to be with me for always. So Jerry was racked with emotional pain by the time Sheree finally got back in touch with him. And then again, another trigger warning for descriptions of sexual assault. But again, I have to remind you that this is not real, but it still is grody to hear about. So trigger warning. Oh my God, I cannot believe this is all made up. Cherie claimed that Bruce had not only beaten raped her, but then he had ordered two of his mafia henchmen to kidnap her, take her to a remote location and gang rape her and beat her. (laughs) She sent him a photo of her body covered with bruises and told him once more that evil Bruce Miller had set in motion events that caused her to lose the babies because she had miscarried. Oh, my God. Now, the photo that she sent him is graphic, but she would later admit to using her Mary Kay makeup to make the bruises on her body. Oh, my God. Now, of course, again, we're, I'm, let's go back to Jerry's part of mine. He doesn't know any of this is no. fake. It's all very real to Jerry. So hearing that paired with the photos of a beaten and bruised Cherie and the pain of losing the babies he had desperately wanted again, Jerry finally said he would do what Cherie had been asking him to do all of this time. Yep. He'd kill Bruce Miller. Together, he and Cherie came up with a plan. All over instant messenger. Very aligned with our current affairs that we just recorded. Yes. It's all very easy. You can read line by line how Cherie gave Jerry all these ideas and how they completely plotted this murder together. So Jerry called his brother and he said that he was planning to go up to this family hunting cabin that they had for the weekend. Okay. But he added ominously that if he wasn't back by 6 p.m. on Tuesday to come find a briefcase under his bed. Hmm. He also gave Cherie the number of a Kansas City defense attorney to call in case he was caught. So he was planning all the contingencies. Like, what happens if Bruce kills him? Yeah. 
then his brother will have all of this evidence in this briefcase. What happens if he gets arrested? Then Cherie will have the number of a defense attorney to immediately call for him. Yep. Because he knows the system. So Cherie continued to drive home the danger she was in and how there was no other option until the bitter end. So she's on AOL saying, like, I hope this works because if it doesn't, I'm dead. Like, if this somehow goes wrong and he knows it was me, he's going to kill me. Absolutely. So this has to go right. And then she also said to him, and this is all on AOL Instant Messenger, Jerry, are you going to be able to live with this for the rest of your life? Because I can. You are so good. Are you sure? I can, you know, the rest of my life, we never talk about it, never. And he wrote, I love you. She wrote, answer me. He said, we will never discuss it again. I love you. Yes, I can. And she said, answer me. I love you too. And he said, especially after those pictures. And she said, Jerry, tell me you will forgive me. Tell me one day we can have a baby and nothing will happen to it. And he said, my God, we will, honey, you and me, I love you. And she said, tell me you forgive me. He said, I forgive you that you have nothing to be sorry about. She said, do you mean it? He said, I love you. I'm doing this, ain't I? And she said, I love you so much. And I wanted those babies. It hurts. And he said, I know. Just tell me you will be with me soon. And she said, Jerry, I will be with you very soon. And he said, I love you. On November 8th, 1999, less than six months since Jerry had met Cherie online. Oh, my God. Not even in person. Just... That first meeting online, he got into his truck and he drove 700 miles to kill her unsuspecting husband. Around 2 p.m. that day, Cherie and Jerry met at a gas station so Mm. she could give him her cell phone. So the plan was because Jerry knew all the ins and outs of investigations, he knew that they could not have any recorded contact. Yeah. Instant messenger is okay. I asked Nathaniel about this. And he was like, I think in the 90s, even the late 90s, people thought, like, no one could get anything off the Internet. Like, if you deleted it, it was gone. Like, you delete the conversation, you delete the profile. Yep. It's just gone. Nobody can get it. That's what I think people thought. And I don't know, especially given that Jerry wasn't a cop for very, very long, and he was mostly a cop in the late 80s, they probably weren't doing a lot of computer forensic work at that time. So I really don't think that they thought anyone was ever going to see these instant messages. But he didn't want his cell phone anywhere near the scene. So he drove, called Shree from a payphone at the gas station to tell her where to meet him. Yeah. And she gave him her phone because it was already in Flint. And the plan was that Shree was going to make sure she had a friend over to her house, her friend Jennifer. So she had an airtight alibi with her children. And Bruce was closing down the salvage yard shop that day. So she was going to basically call him under the guise of saying, can you pick up some takeout food on your way home after you close down the shop for dinner for me and the kids? Yeah. And then she would be able to ascertain if he was alone or not and if it was a good time. And if it was, she would then call her own cell phone, let it ring just once and hang up. And that would be the signal to Jerry that he was in position and he could go and kill him in the office at the salvage yard. Okay. So this is the plan. And that's exactly what happened. So she did that. She left the call. And then after she gave Jerry the signal, she actually called Bruce back one more time. Hmm. And she told him that she loved him. And then he said, okay, well, I have to get off the phone because it looks like a customer just pulled in. (gasps) But it was no customer. It was Jerry Cassidy with a 20-gauge shotgun. He said, hi, I'm Jerry. Because Cherie had told him not to say anything, to just shoot him. Okay. Because, of course, she didn't want Bruce to have the opportunity to say who. But Jerry believed that he had been talking to Bruce, and he wanted Bruce to know who he was. Of course. Yeah. He's doing the worst thing that you can ever do in the entire world to someone and going against his entire moral compass and what he was trained as a professional to do. And the only way that he could have convinced himself that this was worth it was knowing that he was doing something that was going to be justified, which is killing someone who is abusing and terminating the pregnancies of and a person he loves. And sexually assaulting. Mm-hmm. I don't think there was any way that he couldn't have done any of this if he didn't get that mad. Well, he believes he's like Liam Neeson. Yes. In a movie that is doing something outside of the law, but for justice. Yes. 
and it's only for that justice that he would have been able to do it. Exactly. So of course he has to tell him who he is. Of course he does. Yes. I mean, and Cherie really set this up. She knew exactly what type of person he was. So he said, hi, I'm Jerry. And then he pulled the trigger. And this type of shotgun does insane damage. Like a big shotgun? Yes. Okay. And at close range. The authors of the book described it as Bruce's throat and upper chest exploding in gore. Yeah. You don't return from this. Yeah. Jerry then took a wad of cash out of Bruce's pocket, which was right where Cherie had said it would be, all in the instant messages, and lifted his wallet in an effort to make the killing look like a robbery. He got back in his truck, got back on the road, and called Cherie's home number, letting it ring once and then hanging up as the signal that the job was done. Yep. On his way back to Missouri, Jerry tossed the cell phone and gun, so he got rid of the evidence. Okay. Meanwhile... Cherie performed an Oscar-worthy performance, calling people and asking them if they had seen Bruce. Where was he? I don't know where he is. Eventually, she asked her brother-in-law, Chuck, to drive to the salvage yard and check on Bruce. And originally, Chuck was like, screw you, there's a football game starting. Like, he's always late. It's just Bruce. Don't worry about it. But then, apparently, she, like, drove over there with one of her sons, and, and she couldn't get in because there was, like, a lock on something. And so she was so hysterical that finally Judy, Chuck's wife, was like, fine, we'll just drive over there and check on him because you're being crazy. And she had set it up in a way that Bruce's brother, Chuck, had to be the one to find his body. Of course, she couldn't. mm Wow. Which is also, like, pff. Chuck and Judy are also on the 2020, and... It makes your heart ache yeah, that just... he was put in that position. Cherie did a good job acting, though. The cops believed that she was genuinely shocked and upset. They began investigating Bruce's murder, and Cherie, the grieving widow, gave them a tip. John Hutchinson, Bruce's friend and former employee, had borrowed two grand from Bruce. And I guess that they had had some fights about it not getting repaid. Furthermore, though, the cops did not know this. Cherie did not tell them this. This is the John Hutchinson who was an ex-boyfriend of Cherie's, that she had had sex with this man while he was married, but on a break. So she is setting up her ex-lover who had the gall to go back to his wife and end their affair. Of course she is. But she doesn't tell the police like, oh, this is an ex-boyfriend of mine. She says, look, this guy used to work for us and it looks like he was trying to do some VIN number scam on cars and then also he borrowed this money, and now with the money being gone, I, I really think it might have been him. And John Hutchinson had a brother named Harold who also worked at the salvage yard. And so John Hutchinson to this day, he's also on the 2020, does not know why his brother said this. But if he worked at the salvage yard, that means that he was spending time with Cherie, who worked there. Yeah. So I'm guessing that she put something in his head because Harold had intellectual disabilities. And the police even said that he was easily led. So he tells the police, yeah, it was my brother because they were fighting and I heard my brother say he was going to kill him. Oh, my God. And the police at that point were like, wow, I mean, he's looking pretty good for this. Yeah, his own his brother, brother yep. is turning him in. But they also were aware that Harold didn't make a strong witness because of his disabilities. Yeah. And so that they needed more evidence. But it did not help matters when John failed two polygraph tests in a row. And his alibi was that he was home alone. So no one could verify it. But they're still (sighs) investigating because they need more evidence. There's a lot of reasonable doubt still with John's case. Absolutely, yeah. Like the fact that he didn't do it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yeah, there it is. So Bruce did not have a will at the time of his death. But despite how it was portrayed on the Lifetime movie, Cherie did not make a whole lot of money off of Bruce. She ended up cutting a deal with Bruce's kids that she would get the salvage yard and potentially the house too, I believe, and they would get something like $75,000 of insurance money. Okay. I think that there was some hidden assets because I saw a conflicting report that said she got all together somewhere in the neighborhood of like $150,000 worth of stuff. But I think that the salvage yard might have been worth a hundred grand. It's still a lot of money. It's still a lot of money, but everyone thought that that was too paltry a sum to kill for, given that he was going to adopt her kids and take care of them. Yeah, but, you know. 
Yep, she's not really motivated by money. Cherie kicked off her grieving process by getting wasted at a bowling alley where she sings karaoke. Mm, class. We, we all grieve differently, <laughs> and some people just do it by singing drunken karaoke while you hear some middle-aged men hit those pins. So she ended up hitting it off with the guy who ran the karaoke program, and his name was Jeff Foster, and he drove a Schwann's truck as his day job. Did you have the Schwann's men where you grew up? No. Oh, so sad for you. Okay, so the Schwann's delivery man even came out to our farm. And you know how remote that is. What is it? I think it started as ice cream, and it was still ice cream. But they also had different types of frozen meals and all sorts of food items. But I remember seeing the Schwann's truck just bustle down my quarter of a mile long driveway and getting, like, so excited. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what that is. Well, this guy also got known in the press as the Schwann's man. And Jeff is like, oh, my God, I'm so much more than that. I'm also the karaoke guy at the bowling alley. (laughs) Get your LinkedIn profile straight. Exactly. I do suspect, too, that they were fooling around before Bruce's death. I would think so, too. And that would make another motivation factor. It seems like he came on the scene very quickly after Bruce passed away. So only three or four weeks after the murder, Cherie had already moved Jeff into her house. Wow. Bruce's family was shocked at the speed in which she had seemingly gotten over Bruce's death, her husband, of less than a year. But no one was more shocked that Cherie had a live-in boyfriend than her other boyfriend, the one who had killed for her. Yeah, I mean, I think that'd be pretty shocking for him. Yeah, so Jerry was a former police officer, so he knew that he could not be in constant contact with her right after the murder. No, it would not look good. No, so he had waited an appropriate window, and then he had resumed calling her and emailing her only for her to pretty much completely ghost him. Risky business when he's got all the dirt on you. It's ballsy. I think she was really taking into account the fact that he would Potentially not turn her in because it would implicate him, obviously. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so there was a couple times that he tried to come out to see her and she would meet him at a hotel. She did not want him to be near her house for a couple reasons. Number one, she had a live-in lover already. And number two, he would notice that there were some discrepancies in the stories that she had told him. One of which being... And he did discover this later because after she refused to let him see her house, he's a former cop. He was able to look it up and then drive by. So he did find this out anyway. But one of the things that she had told him was the time that she was allegedly raped by Bruce on their pool deck. Yep. So he drove by the house and she had described like an in-ground pool covered with trees in a private backyard. And really, the pool was an above-ground pool basically in their front yard. So all of their neighbors would have been able to see it if you're just walking down the street. So he was like, that doesn't make any goddamn sense. Somebody would have stopped that assault if it had been occurring there. And also there was just details about her life and how she had described it and the things she owned that were just not adding up. So when it became clear that she was no longer interested in him at all, emotionally, physically, spiritually, I mean, anything, she was just straight up ditching Jerry 100%. He got so frustrated that he was like, well, I killed somebody for you. I murdered a man for you and you won't even be with me. So she kind of was like, well, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, she also is just like not answering his call. So it's just like an overall disrespect, it seems like. So much disrespect. In fact, yeah, he even tried to hook up with her at one point when he had pushed for a meetup at a motel near her house. And they kissed a little. And then she said, no, this would be very disrespectful because I'm with Jeff now, which didn't bother her when she was with Bruce or the first wow. husband that she had lied about who I think was also coincidentally named Jeff. Remember the imaginary brother of Bruce? Yeah. So at that point, he's like, well, give me some money then because I know you made money in his estate. So in the very least, I want to get a payday. So to avoid Jerry going to the authorities in the off chance that he was really going to make some trouble for her, Cherie said that she would see what she could do. She's like, I haven't actually gotten that much. It's still all tied up, but I'll do my best. Jerry had an absolutely miserable Christmas, realizing that he had killed a man for no reason. 
And he was beginning to suspect that maybe Bruce hadn't been all that Cherie had described. No. By early February 2000, Jerry had lost any hope for reconciliation with Cherie. No money had arrived from her either. He had lost his once promising career in law enforcement. He had lost his wife, Barbara. His family had been torn apart. He was in debt. He was still stinging from the loss of the babies that he had believed had been in Cherie's belly. And now it was even looking possible that an innocent man, John Hutchinson, was going to go down for the murder he had committed. It's a lot. It's a lot. Jerry wanted to come forward. He absolutely wanted to do the right thing after so much wrong. But he knew also that ex-cops fare very poorly in prison. Jerry Cassidy saw only one way out. He gathered evidence, he wrote his goodbye letters, and he put the briefcase back under the bed. He then turned on his favorite country music channel and sat staring out at the lake and the three pictures of the people he had loved. His ex-wife, his sons, and his Cherie. Which, when I saw pictures of the scene, it looks like the picture that was taken, the portrait that was taken on her wedding day to Bruce, which is doubly Strange. twisted. Yeah. Yeah. Then Jerry Cassidy, trigger warning for suicide, y'all, shot himself in the head. When the police found him, he had an open Bible in his lap. It was turned to the fifth chapter of Matthew, which read, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. It's really sad. On the 2020 episode, his mother is talking about how this was all so horribly sad for them. And she said that he was his own executioner. He judged himself. He found himself guilty. And he executed himself. Yep. That's pretty accurate. That was the only way he knew how to deliver some semblance of justice for Bruce. And to avoid an innocent man, John Hutchinson, to go to jail for his crime. Yeah, so the same day that Jerry's body was found, a $3,000 check arrived from in the mail from Cherie. Isn't that wild? That was her hush money. I feel like that wouldn't have done much for him. Because if you felt that deeply about how bad something you did is like $3,000. No money is going to fix that guilt. It wouldn't have even gotten him out of the financial hole that he was in. And in fact, the Cassidy family actually used that money to cremate Jerry and to lay him to rest. So in an ironic twist, it was Bruce's money that paid for Jerry's funeral. Crazy. Jerry had left a note for his brother to take the briefcase to a defense attorney in Kansas City and open it. Now, this defense attorney knew Jerry kind of from when he was in law enforcement. And Jerry had always thought he was one of the good guys and he thought they had a good relationship. But when he got a note that said, you're only to open this briefcase in the presence of this one particular man, the attorney was like, I'm going to consult with the police. And the police were like, yeah, maybe there's a bomb in there. We have to figure that out because why would he want it opened around one person. Like maybe he killed himself and he's going to take somebody out on his way out or to somebody's. So a bomb squad was called and after a few hours they determined that this briefcase was definitely not going to blow up. But when it was opened up, it would blow up a certain someone's life. Inside the briefcase, Jerry had included a letter to the attorney detailing his relationship with Shree her pregnancies, the abuse she had suffered at Bruce Miller's hands, and his confession that he was the one who had shot and killed Bruce Miller. He said that Cherie had also planned and set it up, and he included printout copies of all of their IMs, all of their emails, every promise that Cherie had ever sent him, including pictures of her body looking pregnant or looking abused. I mean, everything. He kept it all, and he printed out to make sure that they had it. I can't believe that the IMs were used as evidence. IMs. Yep. I haven't heard someone call it IMs in a long time. Yeah, it's it's just piles and piles of evidence, and I do not know what Cherie was thinking, that they could not access these messages, that she wasn't. Yeah. 
<laughs> so the attorney at that point told the family that they had a very hard decision to make, Jerry's family. They were not legally required to turn anything over to the police. They would not have to publicly reveal that their son and brother, whom they were grieving, was also a murderer. And there was really no option for the Cassidays. When Charlene, Jerry's mother, thought of how Bruce had suffered, how her own child had suffered because of the manipulations of this woman, there was not a chance, despite what it would do to Jerry's legacy, that she would not go after this woman for what she saw as putting two men in their graves. Yep. And if you think about it, ruining another man's life, I mean, countless other people's lives, but John Hutchinson is on the 2020 episode as well, and he is destroyed. He was really close with Bruce. He really loved him. And he was kicked out of his funeral. Everyone in town believed that he was a killer. So horrible. If Jerry had not had that briefcase of evidence, there is a very strong possibility that he would have been wrongfully convicted. I mean, as if a funeral isn't a horrible enough thing to have to go to and then to be kicked out when you didn't do anything wrong. And it was Cherie, too. She started screaming, he killed my husband, he killed my husband, get him out of here. Wow. Yeah, he had left a note for his parents as well. He apologized to his mother, writing, I was so blind and so stupid and so much in love. Little did I know she never meant any of it. She wanted all of her money and no more husband. Sheree was involved. I have all the proof. She will get what's coming. And indeed, she would. Please enlighten us. Yes, the karma fairy is just rubbing her little palms right now, getting ready to sprinkle some justice. The attorney sent the briefcase of evidence right over to the Flint PD, and they knew that it was an open and shut case. Did not even mean to do that with the briefcase open and shut. <laughs> <laughs> now I can't not see it. <laughs> While interviewing Jerry's friends and family, they uncovered lie after lie after lie. One of the most egregious lies had been that twice she had told Jerry that she was pregnant with his babies, the babies he so desperately wanted, and twice. That had been total bullshit because medical records would show that Cherie had her tubes tied in 1995. These women who have their tubes tied and then lie about being pregnant just boggle my mind. It feels even more egregious for some reason. It is. It is. That's because it is. <laughs> yeah. That they know it's not even possible and that she kept dangling having a baby together in the future when she was trying to get him to kill Bruce. We'll be happy someday. Then we can finally have a child that he won't kill. Yeah, it's horrifying. It seemed that Jerry had believed to the end that she had been pregnant. He had written to his mother that he had wanted those babies more than anything. But it also seemed as though he might have had second thoughts about whether Bruce had actually been that abusive and whether or not it was Bruce actually speaking to him on the BD junk name during those IMs. Somewhere on the 2020, it was said that he had committed what he thought was justifiable homicide. Instead, he was coming to realize that he had committed cold-blooded first-degree murder to a maybe innocent man. Yep. And now it was Cherie's turn to face justice. Cherie was interviewed before she was arrested, and you can catch pieces of the interrogation on Forensic Files, and I believe the 2020 as well. And she totally denied everything. They are showing her IMs. They're like, this is you. This is Jerry. You were planning a murder. And she's like, oh, you can fake IMs. I can fake any email I want. You just fake that. Try to get something out of me. She's like, absolutely not. And then they're like, okay, what about this sex tape that we found in Jerry's trash? Like his, not computer trash guys, like his physical waste paper basket because it's a VHS again. And it was like, why is there a VHS videotape printed with for Jerry's eyes only and love you love Cherie <laughs> love Cherie and you masturbating all over it while lip syncing to country music if you don't know Jerry and you were not romantically involved in, with uh, him how do you explain that Cherie she was kind of just like oh people just do stuff on the internet I just talked to some guy and I had a fantasy life Bruce was totally on board with it but it never went anywhere. 
And so at any any point, she was still denying, denying, denying. It's kind of amazing. Oh, I mean, she went down with that ship. And forensically, the police were able to prove that the instant messages had been genuine. Sherry was arrested for secondary murder and conspiracy to commit murder. The case blew up in the media and was dubbed the first internet murder in the United States. She was also arrested coming home from Reno with her boyfriend, Jeff, which was really classless. Apparently, she even made plans to go see Jerry's friends, Gloria and Carol, and was like, can you not mention Jerry to my new boyfriend? And they were like, he literally just died. And he used to work here and everyone's really sad about it. So yeah, somebody might mention it. And apparently he was super wasted, Jeff, the boyfriend, when they got off the plane. And it was like, surprise, you're arrested. And he was like, what's going on? And they're like, your girlfriend's being arrested for murder. And he's like, oh, shit, that is a really bad plane hangover. On December 12th, 2000, Cherie faced a jury of her peers. Her defense attorney argued that Cherie had zero motive to kill her husband. She did not stand to inherit a ton of money. And this was a good, kind man who was worth more to her alive than dead due to the fact that he planned to adopt her children and take care of her for life. They argued that the IMs and the emails were falsified by her jilted lover, Jerry Cassidy. They suggested that Jerry had set Cherie up as a last F you because he was so bitter about their breakup and then he had committed suicide. But interestingly, Andy, the defense did not present Jerry as the killer. They said that he tried to frame her with his knowledge of law enforcement and because he was mad about the breakup. They maintained that John Hutchinson had killed Bruce. So fucked up. Yep. And even presented his brother, Harold, who again had some intellectual disabilities who testified that he, again, overheard John threatening to kill Bruce. And this is, I mean, this ripped a family apart. John said that he's seen his brother Harold one time in his entire life after this. Yeah, but I, it makes sense why they can't say that Jerry killed him. You know what I mean? You know why? Because then it gives some sort of validity to all the stuff that he left, pinpointing it back to, back to her. Exactly. And she's still the motive. Even if she had nothing to do with it and he framed her later, he still killed because of their affair. So at some point, there's a thread of culpability there that isn't there if they continue to blame John Hutchinson, who I feel so poorly for. Like, he was crying on the 2020 about Bruce and not getting to say goodbye. Yeah. Oh. The prosecution presented forensic texts who testified to the authenticity of the messages backed up with data from AOL, including the fact that both Cherie and Jerry were logged on every single time at the same time that these messages that were supposed to be faked were sent. She's like, no, it was my Sims character acting (laughs) as me. (laughs) It was AI. Oh, God, the future is scary. They portrayed Cherie as a cold-blooded, money-hungry cheat and liar who manipulated her lover into doing her dirty work. The prosecutor on the case said that Cherie's fatal flaw was taking the stand in her own defense. Her credibility was absolutely destroyed during cross-examination because the prosecutor was able to catch her in lie after lie after lie. So in 2022, Cherie did an interview with 2020 where she talked about the case and the reporter brought up the lies both in her interrogation and on the stand and the fact that she rejected a pretty sweet plea offer. And she said, I felt like I could talk my way out of anything. She at that point was so convinced of her sociopathic superpowers that she insisted that she be able to take the stand because she believed that she would be able to manipulate the jury. Yep. Sounds right. But Cherie was very wrong. After two days of deliberation, the jury found her guilty of both counts And she was sentenced to life in prison for the conspiracy charge and 54 to 81 years for second degree murder. Shri was Pikachu face shocked. She had finally found one situation she could not lie her way out of. 
So this is a happy ending. She is going away for life, right? Well, yeah, minus multiple people losing their lives for no reason. <laughs> okay, you're totally correct that this is not a happy ending. There's no such thing as happy endings in true crime. But when justice is served, at least we get an ending. Yes. But that is not what happened in this case. In August of 2008, a federal judge overturned her conviction and ordered that she receive a new trial. The judge found that Jerry's suicide note should not have been admitted into court because Jerry was not there to be able to be cross-examined. Uh, so she got out. What? Yep, Sherry was released from prison to await her new trial. This was unspeakably hard on Jerry and Bruce's families and even on her own family that was still trying to grapple with what their mother had done. And it is really sad, very bittersweet and sad, but sweet that Jerry and Bruce's families actually got along, that they held, basically Bruce's family did not hold any resentment for what Jerry had done because they also knew that he had been terribly manipulated. When they are in that courtroom and they're hearing the evidence and they're seeing what she said to him, like I said to you guys, like there's pages and pages and pages of this stuff. She brought him to these emotional highs and these devastating lows that they did choose to forgive Jerry. I mean, they are there seeing everything and they're being good people who see the common denominator as the problem as being Cherie, not as either of the men. However, remember she was out for a little while? In 2012, the district court ruled that the suicide note possessed sufficient guarantees of trustworthiness to satisfy defendants' constitutional right of confrontation. Basically, this counted, they said that Jerry was trustworthy, number one, but also that this was a dying declaration, which we've talked about how when people are saying something as they die, that it can be admitted. So Cherie went back to prison, and this time, seemingly, for good. In a shocking move in 2016, Cherie typed a four-page letter that fully confessed to her role in Bruce's murder. Good. On 2020, you never see Cherie. She's just over the phone, but you hear this interview. She also came clean about how she was responsible for both Bruce and Jerry's deaths. Bruce on purpose and Jerry's suicide by her own actions. Cherie said that she knows that there's no way she will ever get out of prison, so telling the truth was about finally after so many years, doing the right thing. She even said because she had made so many wrong decisions that she had done the wrong thing over and over and over again that for once in her life she wanted to do the right thing. And the 2020 reporter asked the question we all want to know, why? What was the real motivation in manipulating Jerry to kill Bruce? And she said this, and this is a quote, if I could just say it was so I could get the money, it wouldn't sound as bad as what it really was. Bruce was so close to knowing who I really was, like what was really inside of me. The consequence of Bruce dying was smaller than what the consequence would have been if he had known I wasn't who he thought I was. It was a game to me. Ew. She would later say, it was like a video game for me. Each level was a man, each level was harder, and I was trying to see how much I could get away with. This is literally someone else's life. I was just, she just kept upping the ante. I think given her traumatic past, this was finally something she felt like she had control over. And when she got a little control... She wanted more and more and more until she was playing God. She was determining the fate of a good, kind-hearted man who had taken care of her and her children, who was beginning to suspect that she was not all she had portrayed. How are her kids now? Were they on the 2020? They were not on the 2020, but she said that, that she does have a relationship with them. She said that... She cannot believe that they still love her after everything she put them through, but she gets to see them during visits and see her grandchildren. And of course, she got to spend time with them when she was briefly living on the outside. And the reporter made a point to say, Bruce and Jerry will never have those gifts. They will never get to visit 
their children, their grandchildren, their grandchildren won't get to meet them, at least some of them. She has to be have like a semblance of remorse in order for her to have that realization of why she, like the petty reason as to why she murdered someone, right? She's very well spoken. So they recorded apologies that she made on 2020 and played those apologies for the family members affected. So Bruce's brother and sister-in-law for Jerry's mother. And when you hear these apologies, they sound very genuine. It does sound like she's had a lot of time to think and, and realize the error of her ways. But that doesn't mean that she is owed forgiveness, like we've talked about. And I can tell you definitively that at least when the 2020 was filmed, Jerry's mother was not inclined to give her that forgiveness. She said, I just hope she rots in hell. Some things are just not forgivable. So I do have one Wikipedia fun fact. Wikipedia fun fact. And that is that, like I mentioned earlier in the episode, there is a Lifetime movie from 2006 about this case called Fatal Desire, starring Eric Roberts as Jerry and Anne no. Heche as <gasps> Cherie. Wowie. And they changed some details. I was watching it with Nathaniel and I was like, oh, well, this didn't actually happen. This actually happened like this. And he's like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm already watching a Lifetime movie from 2006 with you. Please leave me alone and let me watch it. I was like, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So actually, this has surprisingly good ratings on IMDb. And I have to concur. It was a pretty good movie, I think. It wasn't as ridiculous as some of the Lifetime movies that I've seen. And I got to say... Anne Heche was unhinged as Cherie, appropriately so. In conclusion, it's important to remember that even if somebody is the same person as the picture, they can still catfish your ass. Yeah, you always gotta be super careful about who's asking you your ASL. Always. And as always, trust your gut when it comes to love so nobody gets cyber sex to death. Bye. Bye. 